let's get started. So who knew that such a small assignment would create so many questions? Um, so a number of students came to office hours with various questions. Um, So one was, um, what should they comment? Right? Um, and usually when students ask questions, there's actually two questions. One is like, well, what do I need to do to get my points? Which is understandable. Um, and the other one is, you know, what's the answer here? Um, in general, I try and avoid answering the former question because it doesn't do any good. Well, you get your points, but then, but you don't learn anything, right? If I say do, if I do A, then immediately what happens is you do A and all your friends are gonna do A and this is gonna propagate through the network, right? And then, oh, Whitney says do A, and so everyone does A, but they don't know why, but they don't care, right? But they get the points. Um, so when the question is, what should I comment comes up, right? If we answer the latter question, it gets more complicated, right? Because why are we, you know, what are the comments for? The comments are for readers to help them understand what's going on. And the difficulty is when you're writing the code, all the details you need to know are in your head, right? You know all those details, right? But in six months, do you remember those details? Maybe, sometimes, right? You might, um, but in general, no. And so how do you know what type of thing you should comment so that in six months or a year, when you come back or someone else comes back and reads your code, you've written what they need to know, right? And that's not an easy question to answer. I can't say do X, Y, and Z because it's gonna be highly dependent upon what you're doing, right? Um, and so it's, the long-term answer is you have to start paying attention to what happens, right? When you're reading someone else's code and you come across a piece of code that you can't understand right away and it's hard to understand, what information would you have needed to help you make, make that easier to understand? When you, when you read your old code, it's like, well, why did I do that? I mean, what's going on here, right? And I'm sure you've all had that experience, right? It was like, oh man, yeah, I guess I did that. Um, it's got my name on it, so I must have done it, but I don't remember the details. Why did I do it this way? You know, what information would, would have been useful, right, to help you understand the code? You know, if, if companies and managers are more reasonable, I would say everyone should become a maintenance programmer for like six months to a year just to get that experience of having to deal with this code that they didn't write and had to fix it, right? And it's a very good experience. The problem is once you become a maintenance programmer, sometimes it's hard to get out of that. I mean, they're like, okay, you're stuck now, right? It becomes sticky. It's like, no, no, I've, I've, I've served my time. Let me go do something else. And that can be hard. All right. Now, in general, um, if you're explaining what you're doing, you probably don't need that unless the code is very complicated, right? And the code is very complicated, then maybe you should ask yourself how to make it less complicated. So it's you know, why am I doing this? What's, what's, 
What's the purpose? Right? And often a high level view is missing, right? You've got 30 files. It's like, what's going on? What's this all about, right? Now I have to go through each file and figure out what each one is doing. There's no overview. It's just like, here's here's 30 files. Here's 100 files. Here's, um, here's 10 classes. And like, oh, I mean, now I have to go find, look at the classes and try and piece them all together. And then I can dive in to see what's going on. You know, programming is hard, right? And that's why at least some companies pay a lot of money for people who can do it. And we, we, call, it, we call it computer science. You know, my feeling is only fields that feel insecure call themselves sciences, right? It's not, it's not physics science. It's not chemistry science, right? It's physics. It's chemistry, right? They know their science, right? Social science, is that a science? <laughs> Computer science, is that a science? I mean, why do we call this, right? So a lot of what we do is engineering, right? We build things, right? And yeah, some people discover theorems and people you know, think about theories and computer science, but most of us, we build things, right? That's why people pay you, they build things, right? We write software um, and that's more like engineering. Although engineers don't like this, they don't like us to say that. At one point at San Diego State, engineering, the engineering college um, didn't like the fact that we called ourselves computer. We were engineering. We use the word software engineering, right? Like, no, no, that's not engineering. You can't use that term. We go, all the books say software engineering. So, but, but still, we build things, right? And when you're building things. Um, it's experience that counts a lot, right? You have to figure out what works and doesn't work, right? And of course, we've got heuristics and we've got design patterns, we have various things to help us out so we don't have to repeat everyone's other mistakes, but still you have to pay attention to what works and doesn't work, right? When, when you come across a piece of code, you understand why, what, why can't you understand it? What would help to understand it, right? You know, we'll, we'll talk later about um, testing. And again, what happens is there are certain certain types of mistakes that most of us make, and there are certain types of mistakes that individuals will make, right? We have blind spots. And so if you don't pay attention to what, what types of mistakes you commonly make, then you're just gonna make them over and over again. But if you start doing unit testing and then think, okay, wait, you know, I make this mistake, this is a common type of mistake to make, well, I better test for that. You know, one story that I, I tell over and over again, and I once worked with a group of students and we'd get together Friday nights and we'd write software and build stuff just for the ex experience, right, to practice. And we would try and practice all these different techniques and so we'd pair programmed and we'd write unit tests first. And so we were, I was pairing with someone and, and I, we were gonna write this little piece of code and I wrote this test and I wrote that test. And I wrote a third test. And the student was like, well, why did you do, when, why that test, why that test? Um, and then I got called away from the other you know, students that oh, I need help. And it's like, okay, I've written the test, you go ahead and you write the code now. And sure enough, what happened is, he writes the code and the first test passes but the second test fails. And, oh, you're right, I forgot about that. And then he fixes that and the third test fails. And, oh, I forgot, right? And the difference is that I was like, okay, we're solving this problem. What type of things can go wrong? Oh, this can go wrong and that can go wrong and that can go wrong, right? And once you start doing that, once you start paying attention to what can go wrong, what then you start learning what we can do to write better tests. When you start paying attention to what, why is code hard to read, you're gonna be in a better position to understand 
what types of comments you need. Right? Also, students ask, well, if it's a linked list, why are we worrying about capacity? As I explained last time, the problem is I just say build a linked list, then okay, you're gonna go out and there's a linked list class everywhere, and so you just copy this code, put it there, and then I go, oh, that looks like, that doesn't look like a student piece of code, and then I just take your code, and I then Google it, and say, oh, wait, there's, here's 15 lines of code that you have that are identical to those 15 lines on the line, and what's the probability that you get 15 lines of code in a row that are identical, like, bad news, right? So yeah, I mean, you, you, you probably would not use a doubly linked circular queue, circular list for a queue. Um, and we may not then double its capacity, but if it's linked list, we can, you know, we, can, we just create nodes one at a time, right? It's not like we're taking an array and then you have to, have to grow it. So any other questions? No, finally everyone, everyone's done the assignment and so that all the questions are over. And... Question. When we're writing the unit test, you said don't use um, any, of your, any of the collection boxes Right, you test, so that's it. No, no. It's just, um, just yeah, yeah. I mean, again, I'm putting those constraints on for several reasons. One is that I want to see your how you solve the problem as opposed to, right? And if I lift those restrictions, then I have to make this something much bigger to to see what you're doing, right? Um, and I'll do that as we go forward, but I want to have a quicker turnaround time, the first assignment, both to see what you're doing and there's ad, remember on Monday, the ad drop day. And I did something right or wrong because there's that empty seats, right? We had. The wait list went from 35 to 9, and I only added four students. <laughs> that happens all the time, right? I mean, it, and the, the people in the college level just go nuts. They, they look at our courses and like, you've got 60 people in a wait list. You've got all your classes got wait lists, and they, 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 they panic and like, you have to hire more classes, you have to more sections, and they go on and on. We're like, well, yeah, but at the end of the second week, it's just all the wait lists will be basically gone. Um, so it's hard for us to judge what the true demand is. But. So no questions. Um, let's see some announcements, I guess. Um, the reason I have these things in is I try and record the lectures. And so the first class I couldn't record because I didn't have a working machine. The second class I did record and it's online. And then last class, um, the software crashed. The, the problem that happens occasionally, and one of the problems is that I'm using different machine has this have virtual desktops, which I use, but then I got set up. Before I come to class, I set one desktop up for this course, another desktop for the other course, and then a third desktop for whatever I was doing during office hours. And the software I use to actually record it. Um, when I switch from one desktop to the other, it crashes. And so what happened last time is I was busy at the end of the class, closed my machine, 
go to the other class, open it up, swipe to their desktop, and they're like, get this error message, you know, the screen flow had a problem. Do you want to report it? And he's like, okay, it's gone. Um, so I'll try and remember not to do that in the future, but that happens. Um, so we're talking about refactoring. And again, both refactoring and writing unit tests are hard cells. Um, why? Because when you read the follower's book, it says, well, it saves your time, right? You go faster. And he explains, well, the problem is, as code gets more and more, as you build code and it's not in the right, it's not in good shape, to modify it becomes harder and harder, so it slows you down. So he claims that, you know, once you become good at refactoring, if you, you know, do this right code and then ultimately refactoring, that actually your progress will be faster. But it, it seems counterproductive, right? Counterintuitive, like, oh, I'm not gonna be writing code, I'm going to be just modifying the code, not, I mean, I'm changing it, but I'm not adding the functionality. That seems like it can slow you down. Um, writing unit tests also seems counterproductive, right? In the sense of, oh, you're not writing code to add functionality, you're just writing code to the tests. Why not just pass it off to your tester? Um, so, you know, follow up points out, yeah, the rule of three, which is pointed out by someone else, is like, you have a piece of code and they see a duplicate over here. It's like, oh, that's terrible, that's bad. Um, and then you see it in a third place. Okay, now you've got the same code, three places. Now it's time to refactor and So it says, yeah, when you, like when you needed to add a new function or new functionality, it's okay, that's the time to ask yourself, is this code in a good shape to allow me to add this function, right? Um, if it's not, then let's refactor it. So it is, and now I'll make it easier to add that function. Works better. You know, when you have a bug, okay, there's something wrong, right? We missed something. So maybe we should figure out what we missed and why we missed it to make that. Because we're going to go on, we're going to rearrange the code anyway, right? So let's figure out how to make it better. Um, and when you do a code review, right? Has anyone here ever been involved in code reviews? Yeah, a few people, right? You know, I think that. There's this famous quote about democracy being a poor form of government, except all the others are worse. Um, I've also heard that said about code reviews. It's a, it's, a, it's a poor way of maintaining code quality, but it's better than all the other alternatives. Um, it can be painful. But if you're examining code already, right, you're looking through and doing the review, and it, and it seems like a perfect time to says, take some time to, to refactor, but he's like, okay, you you or your team is examining the code, right, to see what needs to be improved and what was good and what's bad. The point of a code review is it good enough to continue forward. Um, when you find something to like, I mean, perfect time to refactor. Otherwise, we're going to write, write a report and then turn the report in and not change the code. If that's what you're doing, then the code review doesn't make much sense, right? Yeah, most programs deal with data in some form, right? It comes from some place, and so interacting with the database um, becomes pretty common. 
And then that that becomes a hard barrier because it's hard to change the database. And so then it becomes hard to, you know, that said, there, there is a entire book, it's a huge thick book on refactoring databases. Um, why? Because I mean, your requirements change, right? And the type of data you want to store in a database then is going to change. And you know, it's not like your database person can discover in advance all the data you're going to need to store and all the format for the next n years, right? Um, And the second one, yeah, you know, if Google publishes an API for this is how you do something, refactoring that becomes hard because you've got all these other third party developers that are depending upon that particular right interface to interact with. And so how do you how do you change that? Or you have Another example is Java, right? Java has this huge library of code, right? APIs, and how do you how do you ever say, oh, we twenty years ago we thought this is a good idea, but we learned, and now we want to change these things, right? It's hard to do, but you got tens of thousands of programmers using that API, and right, so how do you how do you then refactor that interface? Um, and so for a long time, they just never changed anything. They just kept on adding stuff. And there were, there were some methods that were there, but were never implemented. I mean, you can call them, but there's no code behind that method, right? And there are some methods which are not safe to use. And the comment says, do not use this. And they never, I mean, for 20 years, they, ne they never bothered to remove them. Like, it's not safe to use. And it doesn't do anything. Just get rid of it. But it's hard when you've got that many people depending upon you. And refactoring isn't meant to just do. I mean, it's meant to be make small changes, right? And so they improve things, not just completely redo everything. Make it's not an architectural major architectural changes. It's meant to support. Right, so it's basically like, I mean, you, you want to add a new feature, then look, is it going to be easy to add that feature? If the answer is yes, then go ahead. If it's not, then let's refactor the program, to make, make the code ready to add that feature. The analogy I use is, if I need to go from here to there in a hurry, the shortest path is over this desk, right? You know, it's going to be faster for me to walk over here and here and here, right? Um, even though it means that my goal is to go from here to there, I'm, I'm going out of my way, right? Because it's like, well, I could go under it too. I mean, it's just like, ah, ah, right? But it's slower. Right? And the same thing here, right? There are times, right? I mean, you say, oh, okay, we're in a hurry, so I, I need to go on. I, I can't take the time to go around the desk. But it's going to take me more time to go over the desk, under the desk, than just to walk around it here. And that's that's... I can't tell you how hard that is, right? The same thing happens when we talk about writing unit tests. And so I, I knew this guy, he, he worked for a software company and he was primarily a manager, but he did write some code, but he also um, was a spokesman. So he had a blog, he did almost, da you know, almost daily, you know, that sort of thing. That, promote the company and promote technology and blah, blah, blah. And for years, he, 
he promoted unit testing and testing first. And then one time he wrote this article, it was blog, I says, well, you know, actually I've been saying this great, you know, you should, you should write unit tests and do it first, but I never did it. And I said, you know, I, I tried it and it actually works and it saved me time. So I think both refactoring and writing unit tests, they seem counterproductive. And it's not until you actually sit down and do it and see that it saves you time that you you will believe it. All right. There have been plenty of times when I've been doing examples for classes. It's like, oh, you know, I'm the instructor. I've taught this course n times before. I know this material cold. Um, I don't have time to write unit tests for that code. And what happens is like you make, early on you make some silly mistake and you don't catch it until later. And it's like, oh, now I have to go back. And like, where's, you know, you have to debug it, find where the, and it's just, it's for, it's for example, right? So it's not much code, but you have to go back and you have to find the error and that takes time. And then you have to change it and modify it. And then you make another silly mistake. And then all of a sudden you've wasted half an hour, an hour, just fixing it up is like, and you go, yeah, no, if I would have written unit tests from the beginning, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't have wasted a half hour hour trying to backtrack and find it. And so well, time and time again, when I think, oh, I'm the instructor, I'm good, right? Um, and I don't write unit tests, even code I'm doing for examples, then um, often I spend, I found myself spending more time because you, know, you make silly mistakes. You make and until you actually do it and feel that, oh yeah, wait, I just saved a bunch of time because I caught that error. You know, this becomes it becomes one disease, long life, right? No disease, short life. It's just something that you say and repeat, right? Because everyone else says, oh. You know, unit tests are good, but you don't, it's just a saying, right? And when your manager says, no, it's a waste of your time, what can you say, right? Um, Now, some people don't believe this. They say, look, these days when we refactor, we're going to use ID tools. And so when I rename a function or I extract a method or when I leave the factorings, um, the tool is going to do it for me, so I should be good. Um, of course, that assumes the tool always has it right. Um, and that's not always the case. Um, and once we had a paper where people just said, look, here's, you know, this IDE, here's all the refactorings, and we found these cases where it didn't do the right thing. You know, there were minor cases, right? There were red cases, but. Um, the, the test should be self checking. It should be self checking. Um, it doesn't happen quite as much now as it did, say, five years ago, but you know, when I say you have to write unit tests for your people, go, okay. Um, I'll write tests, you know, this, this J unit or, you know, CP unit, and it's like a little confusing, so I'll just write my own. And so what do you do? Well, you get assignments for a student write code, like input a you know, number. And you put a number and then, it'll, and then it'll call this code and say the output's 12. And for another number, right? And it goes through all the functionality 
And so in this assignment, you might get a piece of, you might write a program that says, okay, enter n you know, numbers for PID numbers, and then I'll add in the queue, and then I'll delete, you know, and then type in where you want to add or delete, add or delete, right? And you have this huge loop where you're continually prompting the user and then printing things out, and it's a lot of work. And it doesn't scale. But in my scale, um, the problem is if you're prompting the user to enter data, then you print out the answer. The user has to know what the correct answer is in order to know whether or not the code is doing the right thing. And when you're writing the code and you worked out a small example on a piece of paper, right? You know when you enter three, the output should be 12. But you may not remember that in a month, right? Plus, if you're working on a team of, say, three programmers, which is a small team, right? And they're writing code for, let's say, six months, and you're going to write these little programs to loop through and ask a user for entered numbers or strings or something. How long will it take you to run that test? Well, after six months of coding, you probably get, you could have, you know, 600 tests, right? Um, and do you remember what the out, quick output is? No. And so what happens is you'll stop, you'll stop running it, but it just takes too long. And sometimes it, instead of prompting the user, they'll say, you know, I ran, I did this in the past, did this in the past, did this in the past. And so then you get, you know, a long list of output, past, not past, right? And again, that doesn't scale very well because if you've got 5,000 tests and each test prints out pass or fail, and with tests that were, then you're going to have this huge output of tests, right? Um, and what happens when the 1,239th test fails, right? You, you, you're you going through reams of paper to find, or you're scrolling across the screen, right? So we want to be self-checking, right? So basically, you run the tests, and then you get a list of one, how many failed. Here are the ones that failed. Otherwise, it just it won't work in an industrial setting. Right? Why do I need to write tests if my ID is doing it? You know, doing your factoring. Well. There could be bugs, right? And not to mention the fact that there could be bugs in your program, and so there are bugs before you refactor, and then you refactor using a tool, you still got the same bugs, right? So yeah, IDs. I mean, they, they have the refactoring, um, and so Eclipse has this big long um, menu for different type different type of refactorings you can do. Um, IntelliJ has one not quite quite as extensive, um, and then of course different languages allow different refactorings. And so here's an example of, okay, I've got a class foo and a class bar and bar, right? So then when you decide I want to rename that class because I didn't think foo was a good name, um, I can then basically select it and rename it. And then every place that it is called is also the name changes there too. And it's sort of nice because why? Well, this is just renaming a class, right? Finding good names is not easy. It can be hard. Um, so I know someone says, yeah, you know, when I'm programming and I can't think of a good name, I'll use a really bad name. Why? Well, because 
when he comes back the next day, he's going to see that bad name and say, oh, that's terrible. Like, plus, often when you when you can't think of it right away, right, it's like, oh, you, you get stuck in the mind. This, what should I call it? What should I call it? You, you're stuck over here, and then you come back the next day, and it's like, oh, you, you're approaching it fresh, and it's like, oh, the answer is I should do this, right? Um, and if it's easy to rename things, then that's, that's, that's simple, right? Okay, I just you know, I select a class, and I right-click, you know, blah, 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 and then type in a new name, and so then it becomes easy. Yeah, so it's an eclipse, right? And here it is, right? Right, so we're all kinds of foods, right? Classes of And then you just write, you know, call your name, and now you go back to the bar, and now it's called, right? So it's renaming the method, right? So like, right? So it, it's just, it's a menu selection, right? And of course, one thing you may not know is that when I changed the name of the class, they didn't change the name of the class in the comment. Because then, that's, that'd be a hard thing to do, right? We have to parse the comment and figure out what, what that means. Um, and so, the other IDs have the common refactorings already built in. And so here's an example where, um, you know, bar, I got this help, call helper method, which is essentially it's food, then calls this helper method. Um, and the helper method just adds um, two elements, you know, calls foo and foo2 and adds them together. And so, why not just, since it's all, all the work is done on foo, why not add that to foo? And so then can we change that helper method and move it over to the foo class where it belongs? So it's an example of move method. And the Eclipse does this, so All right, so foo and foo two. So we want to move that method from where it is to the foo class. So rename a different name and move it to and so move that method to the foo class, recompiled it for us.
Well, what's going on here is that there was a recursive method, and we wanted to move it somewhere else, but the tools are not minute. It's too complicated. I can't do it. Now another one extract class. Let me So what's going on here is a binary tree, but I don't have a node class, right? I've got a tree class, but a node class. And so the tree is acting as a node and as a tree. So it's not a single abstraction, it's doing two things. It's a node and a tree and it's a tree. And so now can we extract the, the left and the right, right? And the value into a node class right, by refactoring. Yeah, so we can select what the name of the class and then what fields of the first class we want to move to the second class. So the, the goal is right instead of being a, a tree instead of being a binary tree, you want to change its type too. And so the, the node class now has the value and the left and the right, but the left and the right are tree, trees. So now we need to And so there was no way of changing it, refactoring the tool to change the type, and so we just change it manually. Yeah, so what's happening here is, is that since we had the tree being both a node and a tree, right, there are various places when we're passing around a tree node when we want to pass around a node, right? So you have to go on, and the, the tool's not gonna, not gonna do that for us, right? Yeah. Anytime you change code, the comments could be invalidated, right? Or, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but I would assume that most of the changes are going to, common changes will be located where you've done the refactoring.
Yeah, but do you, do you want to have a comment that says, I'm going to call method foo on class bar? And then, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, basically, the basic comment is, you modify code or add code or do anything to it, right? The comments could be come out of date. And as you know from personal experience, it happens a lot. Um, well, like, like Paula's book, right? That, the first edition that came out, there was only one tool, one refactoring tool, period. And it was in Smalltalk, so most of the world couldn't use it, right? So he, he, he laid out this whole, and then of course, he thought refactoring is good, and so the ID started implementing them. Um, but still, they don't implement, implement them all, right? And so yeah, now now we're in this weird state where depending on what language you're using, um, you might have an ID that supports a lot of them, or you might be using a language that doesn't support many of them, or any of them. What's that? Um, no, I've seen interesting work where people actually um, We're writing programs to look at comments to find bugs. And they actually were able to do it. And then actually could fix some of the bugs automatically. But, you know, that's, I haven't seen that type of research filter down to actual tools. I don't know about you, but what I find when I learn a new tool or a new language or a new system, there's an initial phase of exploration. How do I do this? How do I do that? Right? And then once I figure out how to do what I'm sort of need to do, then exploration phase is sort of over with. And then the learning cur learning is sort of, I mean, I'm, I can do the five things I think I need to do, right? Um, and that's it. And so I try and try and extend that phase a little longer so I have a better idea with the functionality of what I'm dealing with. So that late in the future, I'm like, oh, I need to do something different that I haven't done before. It's not like, oh, I, I only know five things. I know I'm, I've used five things over and over again, but I remember that there's a bunch of other stuff I can do. And now I can go back and figure out how to do it. Um, so there's this, you know, you learn a few features and like example word you know microsoft word has how many menus and ribbons and right and do you have any idea what ha most of them do no right you just i want paragraphs and i want to put image and i want the image to stay where it is instead of moving around and i'm done right and so there's all kinds of things I can do, but I've never figured it out, so I just don't ever use them. And the same same is true with refactoring tools, right? Oh, I know extract name, and I know extract method, and then I haven't worried about the other ones, and so I don't really do, and so I just don't use them, right? Yeah, and that's the other problem. When you come across a new tool, it, it always seems weird, right? It's like, oh, I'm not used to it. Um, but, but it also could be because it's poorly designed. Um, so I came across a study um, where they looked at um, refactoring is done by professional programmers. And so there's a you know, different 
refactorings, rename, move, extract method, pull up. That's You've got a method or a field in a, in a child class. You move it up to a parent class. Um, you modify your parameters, add or remove parameters. Um, take a take a function call, move it in line, get rid of the function, just wherever it is, just inline it. Um, extract an interface, convert a local right to a field. Um, and and then it they count how many times different programmers used it and how many times they were used. And you see rename is like done all the time, right? Um, and then, and it, by all of them, and then a little over half of them actually call move. And it's called one tenth the time, right? Um, extract methods, the more popular. And, you know, all of a sudden, you know, pull up and uh, modify parameters, inlines, use a lot. After that, it's like, how do anyone does it? And the, how to do it at any, right? Now, of course, rename is going to be the most common one because it's, you can use it everywhere. But it shows that, yeah, there's people, you know, tend to focus in on a small set of, and that's all they use. So if you use an ID, you want to just look at the refactoring menu and see what they all do, right? Figure what they do, right? You know, if you don't know what a cancellate field does, then you're never going to try it and you're never going to use it. Um, and then you'll never understand when and why you might want to use it. Um, I don't remember the the study. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I don't recall whether they whether they look at the source code and look at the transformations being made or. I mean, so just you know, just try them out, right? Get a sample code and rename and move and cancel a field and extract method, extract class. So you, you know you know what they do, you know how to do it. Um, unit testing. So Ralph Johnson, one of the authors of the Design Patterns book, um, he's trying to promote this as a law. Um, if the code's not tested, it doesn't work. Now, of course, everyone intuitively believes this in the sense of whenever you write and you have an assignment, you always test it first if you turn it in, right? You run it, see if it works. Now, the testing may not be automated, may, by, may not be using unit testing, but you run it to make sure it works, right? Um, now, now, what he means by testing is you've got unit tests that you can repeat. Um, when you run the code right manually, um, the problem there is how many inputs do you give? Right, and once the program becomes substantial, you just, you just can't 
spend enough time entering inputs and calling menu items and doing all kinds of stuff. It just, it just takes too long. And again, the problem is we all know the code we wrote in the last half hour, right? We know it in intimate detail. So if at the end of the half hour you discover that something's wrong, it's easy to go back. And those details are still in the head. I know I can change it, to, right? A week from now or two weeks from now or a month from now, we're not going to remember all those details. And so it's, it's harder to, to change it because you have to remember, well, why did I do this or that way? Why is, you know, why, what other things I have to worry about? Because I don't remember anymore, right? Also, if we wait a week or two or, or a month, you've written a lot of code. Now we found something wrong. We have to discover where in that month of, or week of code is the problem. Um, Right, so the longer the time goes between writing the code and testing it, the harder, harder it becomes to find problems and fix those problems. All right, and that's why writing unit tests can actually save you time. Because then it can reduce the time between when you write the code and you test it to find when something goes wrong. When people talk about writing unit tests, they mean you're testing individual code segments. You're not you're not doing functional testing where does this entire application work? It's like does this method on this class do the thing it's supposed to? And they mean automated tests. Not I'm printing out to the the console to say you know I put it four and I got five back. Print statements, um, you know, it won't work in an industrial setting, right? When you're printing things out to say it worked or not, and you've got five programmers working for a year and a half, you may have 5,000 tests, and you're having 5,000 lines of output. Um, in Java, you got that main, it's never hardly ever used, and so you can be tempted to put in there. But again, that you really don't want to ship your tests with your pro with your code, right? It's just doesn't belong there. Um, writing one of these little driver programs to run your program, um, it's more work than than just to write the unit test. So just learn the framework and do it that way. Um, and running a program, yeah, you can, running a program is good, but it's not repeatable. Right? You can't do it over over again. You know, they're not there trying to find a error in that method in that class, right? They're like, we're running the application and checking out the menus and entering weird data to see what goes wrong. Um, and they don't get back to you right away, right? I mean, it's not like you write a code today and tomorrow they, they test it overnight. No, at one point you've got a build, you hand them the build, and then, what, a week later they get a report back, right? And you don't want to waste our time finding silly little problems, right? The more bugs we can find and fix before it goes to the QA team, they can find the more subtle things that involve other types, you know, larger segments of code. Um, another hard sell, um, People push writing tests first. Um, and there's two reasons for doing that. 
one, how many times have you sat down to write code and it's like you got halfway through writing this method and you realize, oh, I don't have the parameters I need or, you know, it's not what I want, right? That happens. Um, but if you write the test first, to write the test, you have to say, oh, what input does this thing need and what output should be there, right? What, what should it be returning? And so it becomes, writing a test for that method or that class becomes sort of a mini design issue. Like I have to, I can't write the test for the code until I understand what the code is supposed to be doing on a fairly detailed level, right? That I have to give it inputs and I have to check the output or the result or the side effect, whatever happens, right? Which means I have to know, okay, I input these two numbers and I get this thing back. And the second reason is that programmers don't like to write tests, All right? So it's like, oh, you know, it's Monday morning, you know, it's slow. Let me do something interesting to sort of get started, right? So I'll write the test after lunch, and then you come back from lunch, and it's like, oh, there's a heavy burrito. And now I have to write tests for an entire morning's worth of work. You know, that's going to be, you know, I'm sort of tired right now. Let me do that tomorrow morning when I'm fresh. Right? I mean, We've all done this, right? We've all postponed doing things for various reasons. And you know, and once you get started, it just snowballs because now it's not just after write three tests, after write tests for an entire morning or entire day, and then two days, and oh, three days, and now it's a week, right? So the other reason is, yeah, if you're writing tests first and then we get that over with, and we don't build up this huge cloud, this backlog of, oh, I didn't do it yesterday. But again, until you actually practice this for a while and start seeing whether or not it speeds you up or slows you down, you're not gonna, you may believe it in the sense of one disease, long life, but you don't believe it in the sense of you understand. You, know, you don't have the experience, oh, I did it and this way and it saves me the time. Now, we have the same problem with writing unit tests as we do with um, writing comments, right? What do we test? Well, as Fowler points out, I mean, you probably don't need to test getters and setters because it's pretty hard to get those wrong, right? You get X and, return, and it returns X, that's, it's pretty hard to get that wrong, so why bother writing a test for that because it's not likely to fail. So what types of things are likely to go wrong? And focus your tests on those. Um, and the common things are boundary conditions. And we've all done this does the loop go from zero to n minus one, or one to n, or two to n plus two, right? I mean, and we often get that wrong, right? And so, okay, we need we need, we need to worry about those boundary conditions, make sure they work, right? Um, often we don't think about, oh, I'm gonna pass in a string, but what happens if the string is empty? Because we're thinking about, okay, the string is going to have a state name in it, so I have to, you know, parse it and do all this stuff. So you're thinking about the main case, but you don't, what happens when someone doesn't enter anything and now it's an empty string? What happens? Or what happens if the string is null, right? So when, when you have a collection like a string or an array list, you know, the boundary conditions are it's empty or has one element or lots of elements or it has repeated elements, right? Those are types of things that can go wrong. Uh, and maybe if it's got repeated elements, it's not supposed to have repeated elements, right? So you're not thinking about it, but what happens when it does have repeated elements, right? Uh, 
I love this one. Oh, this is great. People say this, and it's like, how do you do that? How do you keep your GUI separate from the code that actually does work, right? It's harder than you think. You've got a button, you press a button, and what happens when the button has to do something, right? And so usually people say, look, when you build an interface, there's an interface part, and then the model, which actually does the work, and then you got this controller thing, which no one really knows what it's supposed to do, but, um, right? And the goal is to keep them separate so that, yeah, the model does all your logic, right? But it, it can be hard to keep that, Keep the logic out of the interface part. As soon as in the, any logic is in the interface part, it's hard to test because how do you write unit tests to do that? Well, how do you write a unit test to click on a button, right? Enter something to a text field. So Brian Merrick, um, he was a professional tester. He sort of broadened his scope in recent years. Um, and he wrote several books about testing. And he had this catalog, which gave me permission to talk about. Um, so common things like empty strings, right? Um, collection, empty collection, collection of that element, duplicate elements, maximum size, um, numbers, zero causes problems, right? Because if you do ever divide, then um, the smallest number that could be possible in that in that context, or one below it, largest number, below the largest number. I mean, again, it's just the boundary condition, right? If the smallest thing can happen, the largest thing can happen. And here too, you, you know, keep track of when you write when you write code and, and you come you make mistakes. What type of mistakes are you making? You know, so the Brian says, yeah. What, what professional testers do is when they come across errors, they they re write them down, um, and when, when they see it over and over again, that becomes part of their catalog of things they should always test for. And if we start doing the same thing as developers, you might discover we make a certain type of things that get wrong commonly. And once you become aware of that, then every time you do that type of thing, you're less likely to make that type of error. A common framework for doing these tests is, you know, it used to be called XUnit, but then Microsoft used XUnit for their specific language and tools. So now it's like confusing because it used to be a generic term now, but it's a Microsoft specific term. Um, you know, it started as in Smalltalk and then it was ported to Java and then it was imported to, you know, almost every language out there. Um, and there's, of course, now that it goes on and marches on and every, so we're up to five point something. Um, and depending upon what ID you're using, what, what's your context. I think Android still uses um, version three, not four, but. And it's, it sounds complicated, but basically, you know, you know, here here's a class, to just quite a simple test, right? So we just have a, an integer, and then I just add something, return the value, um, and then in the Eclipse, I can just there's a menu to say I, I need a JUnit test. And then which test, I, what class I want to test on, and the name of the class, my test class. 
And then there's you know, the, the original version of JUnit, you had to add tests to the beginning of a test method. Um, but once Java annotations, you could add annotation to say, OK, here's my test method. But you may have methods which aren't really tests or something else. And all you do is you set, in this case, all I want to do is I want to make sure the add function works. And so I instantiate an object. And now I'm going to you know, call it and make sure the value I get back is correct. And so the basic system is you set up your situation that you want to test, and then you create a search, right? And there's various a search you can call. Um, and then when you run the test, right, the framework then runs each method one at a time, and then keeps track of which asserts are true and which asserts are false, right? So when I run this test method, um, you know, this one, the cert is going to be true because those are values, and so this will pass, and this one will fail because that, that cert statement is, is false. And then when you run it, you'll, the idea will show you, well, historically, if all of them pass, it gave you a green something, and if something failed, you got a red something. Um, some of the ideas are getting away from that now. And then, you know, in Eclipse, I can just run the test. And, you know, it gives a panel. It says, you know, I ran two tests, and it's red, so one failed. And it shows you the ones you failed. And you click on it and go there and see what happens. All right. You know, it's not that hard. and. These days, there's probably a thousand different tutorials online to talk about using this framework in whatever language you're dealing with, right? So it's so don't forget, Monday is a deadline, adding classes, dropping classes. So if you're going to drop a class, that's when you want to do it. You want to graduate this semester to deadline to apply for graduation. And then you've got an assignment to Tuesday.